Have you ever wanted to join a commune? Better yet, have you ever wanted to start a commune? Have you ever wondered how communes work, or how they fail, which they seem to inevitably do? If your answer is yes to any of those questions, this episode is for you. The founder of the Communal Studies Association, Dr. Donald Pitzer, is with me today. Dr. Pitzer also founded the Center for Communal Studies at the University of Southern Indiana and wrote the book on America's communal utopias. Also with me is Jennifer Green, returning from the last episode. Jennifer is a history professor at the University of Southern Indiana and also serves as the school's reference and archives librarian. When I use the word commune, what comes to mind? You might think of huge farms full of hippies or religious fanatics or cults of one kind or another. I realized at the beginning of my conversation with Dr. Pitzer that I really didn't have a clear sense of what this word really meant. I asked him to define it for me. There needs to be at least three to five people not related by marriage or blood. And these need to share some contact. And it may not necessarily have to be land and living right together. It could be this kind of online sort of relationship. But traditionally, we would have said there need to be several people not related. It's not a family as such, although they will call them family and that those people need to be living together and sharing income. Now, the degree to which they do that is something else. Basically, a commune can be entirely online. That had never occurred to me. A commune, it turns out, does not have to be a giant farm where everyone wears overalls and nobody wears deodorant. In case you didn't know, communes and cults, which are often communes gone bad, are making a comeback. People are lonelier and more isolated than ever before, and joining a group like this can offer a deep sense of togetherness and belonging. Yes, I think exactly right. The isolationism that people feel, the loneliness, none of that has to happen in community. And you can do this online. I pioneered in a paper I gave with one of my students one time, communal living in cyberspace. And so getting together now in the way we are, where you can actually see people and talk in this way, people are human. They want other contact. And so to overcome loneliness, And the feeling of having lost self-worth, all of this can be something that you really will almost give up your freedom for a fellowship situation. Part of what interests me so much in the subject, and probably some of what interests you, is the potential for love and community in groups like these, which more often than not seems to turn tragic and dysfunctional by the end. I always caution my students. We're looking at communal groups objectively, and some of them are utopias or near utopias or wonderful. Others are just absolute dystopias. Jim Jones was born in Indiana, and his group in Indianapolis was not communal, but when they finally got to San Francisco and that area, then they adopted this method of communal living and also at Jonestown. I know, I I knew one of the survivors, Laura Cole, who produced a book and also came to conference and she told her story. She just passed away in the last year, but it can be a dystopia. And she still was delighted by many of the relationships that she had, even at Jonestown. And that Jim himself, 
courts had become deranged and really dictatorial and all the rest and led them into their debts. But I think you have to be aware that what you're dealing with is a method of organizing when you just say communal society or intentional community. Just as families or businesses can be good or bad, communes are just a different type of community. I asked Dr. Pitzer how someone might go about starting the good kind of commune. I think that you must, everything must have an economic base. If you lose your economic base, whether you're a church or you're a government, you probably aren't going to be classed in your law. So I think that has to be a practical item on people's minds from the beginning. If you're going to get together with other people, are these people just freeloaders? Are they going to be willing to work hard if it's an agricultural little settlement? Freeloaders will eventually destroy any organization, and communes are no exception. Apart from economics, good leadership and good governance are also essential. And as with every other group, finding the right balance is also important. Even too much democracy can be a bad thing, as it can easily lead to chaos and endless debating. At some point, somebody has to step forward and make a decision. Then I think beyond the economic side, the leadership, the governance, Robert Owen at New Harmony, in his two and a half years there, never set up a proper governance system. That must be done. And they were so democratic, and they were trying to respect women's rights and so on, they held meetings in which there were long debates. In two and a half years, they wrote seven constitutions. So they were trying, but it was a scattered effort. It was, we're seeing it in democracy right now. Democracy is a fragile system and you must protect it. You must be careful who speaks. I've been in meetings where they said, it's total consensus decision. And what I noticed after a few minutes was there were a few people who when they spoke, seem to carry more weight. And there were some people who weren't speaking up at all. And I was in one group of, I suppose you'd call them hippies, in San Francisco. They would take a vote as to whether to open or close the window block. How, how much of that can you do? And what I found in that group, for example, they had a charismatic leader. And that charismatic leader when he spoke, carried sizable weight. Some other people, when they spoke, it didn't seem to me that it really mattered much. So I think you have to be really attentive to the governments. How are you going to make decisions? And how's the work going to get done? The kibbutz in Israel and some other groups that I visited have that down to a science. They have rules and regulations. When I first went to Israel in the 1990s, I should say in the 1980s, they had a rule that the children had their own dwellings and they didn't even eat with their parents. They visited their parents and they were beginning to question that. The parents wanted to have more interaction with their own children and they were beginning to let the children of all things sleep at home. That had not been their system at all. I call that developmental communalism. And in fact, some of my visits with the kibbutzniks helped me to develop that idea. So I think you have to make rules. You have to have a structure. If you don't structure the community, it's like a family. It can just run wild, or there can be some purpose here, and somebody is in control, and there are times to go to bed, and so on. Now, there have been communal groups, 
some of which didn't last very long, and I visited the land where they used to be, particularly hippie communities, where there were no rules, where you could do anything. You could sit in a tree nude, and nobody would look twice because that was your right and that was your thing. You were doing your thing in those days. So I think you have to be sure that if it's going to be a landed place, that the land itself is sufficient for the group that you want to have, and that maybe there are adjacent areas that you can add. However, I should say that most of the communal groups now, intentional communities, are urban. They are not rural. The things that changed in the mid 20th century was that you move from rural communities with a lot of land and agricultural base to people who are living in apartments or in buildings that they own in cities. So from rural to urban. And the other major shift was from total cousin where you share all income, you really don't even own the clothes that you have on, to being capitalistic or having your own income. You work at a job somewhere in the city, you donate to the community what is necessary and expected, but you control your own finances. So these are major shifts, and I think anybody who's going to begin to find a group that they would feel they would want to live close with, because it's, again, like a family. And I can remember at the Danaram, when I would visit there, which I did often with students, and they would say, how do you get along with people day after day? I have to look at that man's face and working here at the mill every day. And then I look at him over the table when I'm eating supper. Do you really want to do that? And so are these people really that commodious? You want to be with people who are commodious. So I think it's a very serious decision. And I appreciate what you're saying, that there are people who are truly looking. And that there are people in communities who are looking for people to join. So whenever it is in your heart to join such a group, if you'll get in touch with particularly the publications and the people of the Foundation for Intentional Community, if you will come to some of the conferences, I think what you want to do is to enmesh yourself a little bit in this tradition. And the conferences will be a place that you can do this. Come to the Center for Communal Studies and its archival collection on the campus of the University of Southern Indiana. Jennifer Green knows the collection very well. She was my assistant in the Center for Communal Studies and then got her degree in library science and um, master's and so she became the archivist there. So she would be willing to help. That's a personal invitation to you from the founder of the Center for Communal Studies. You should take him up on it. We're going to make that trip ourselves as a team in the near future. If you'd like to make this trip yourself or attend a conference, reach out to us and we'll help get you started and connect you with Dr. Pitzer or with Jennifer or visit New Harmony, or some of the other historic sites, like the Amana colonies in Iowa. Talk to their people. They're not communal at Amana any longer, but they have their religion, which goes on, and their faith is very strong. But there are people who can tell you, and it would be good. It would really be helpful in, to become versed in this way of living before you just throw all of your cards on the table or throw all of your resources into a venture. More of these have failed economically 
than have succeeded. There were thousands of communities during the hippie era, 70s, 80s, and co-housing then became a major effort, and uh, the eco-villages and so forth. So there are plenty of communities still existing that can be joined, but these directories and other such resources are there, and I would strongly urge people to think about that and then think about the land that you might be on or buildings that you might be in. Think of the people that you will be with. How are you going to govern yourselves? And how are you going to enforce that kind of government? And do you want to have a charismatic leader? As important as good leadership and good economics are to successful group living, having a clear vision for what you're trying to accomplish and getting buy-in is just as important. I think it all depends on the vision. I think if the people who are going into this, and particularly if there is a charismatic leader, there are always leaders in all groups. And so you have to be careful how you assess that leader and follow that leader. But I'm thinking in the Harmony Society, for example, they did economics right. They did capitalism right. They knew how to grow produce. They manufactured whiskey and fine beer. In fact, their recipe for their beer has been reproduced now in New Harmony, and you can buy it in one of the restaurants there. Their vision was that everything is getting better and better. They were post-millennialists which means the world has to get better and better, get perfected, then Christ can come back and set up the kingdom of God on earth. And that optimism drove them. They were German immigrants anyway, many of them, and so work was just central to them. When I went to Ippingen, where many of them came from in Germany, I heard from the mayor that they have a saying there, work and die. And that's what the Arminists did. And had Christ come back, they thought they were the new Israel. They were the new Jews. And that new harmony would be the center of the world. It It would be the capital of the kingdom on earth And when that didn't happen in 10 years, then George Rapp decided, we need to go back to Pennsylvania, Harmony, Pennsylvania, is still a town there that they had built. And so nearby there, but on the Ohio River, north of Pittsburgh, is economy. And they called it the divine economy. So that was going to be where Christ would come back. And he predicted at one time that it would be in 1828, you don't want to start predicting dates. <laughs> and that was one of the major flaws. But they did get the economic side and the force of the religion, besides that, carried them on because they were going to live with Christ on earth in his kingdom. And it was either going to be New Harmony or it was going to be this economy. What they did wrong was to sell their souls. If you sell your soul to somebody with a vision, and it's always promised in the future, it's always this is what's going to come to be. I love ice cream. I have my freezer filled with ice cream all the time. So it is here now. I have my ice cream and I eat it too. These people are giving up their ability to have more family in the Harmony Society. Their pet perfectionism drives them to this celibacy. And I believe that in the long run, not only many of the members, but even the son of George Rapp himself, Frederick Rapp, who was their business agent, and the mastermind at capitalism. He confronted his father and said, 
and you are going too far. You are demanding too much. And in fact, since he predicted that Christ would come back, there was a person who came from Europe calling himself the Lion of Judah, and that he was the Messiah, and he led a third of the harmonists away from Harmony from Econ in Pennsylvania. Took them off and they set up a couple of communities, one in Pennsylvania and one in Louisiana. 250 people left the Harmony Society because George Raft was becoming totally dictatorial. There is a major downside there, and I think people, you can't be too careful when you're dealing with your life, with your commitments, with your funds. It's like buying stock or becoming involved in a business venture. And I think people sometimes move on with their heart, and that's fine. All of us do that. But I think if you only trust your heart, it's like a love affair. Maybe that works out, maybe that doesn't. And there can be dire consequences. It's a very serious decision that you're talking about if people really do want to live in a communal setting, what they might do is find one that's really working in a way that they feel is what they would enjoy. Join that. It's like buying into a company and so be doing well, rather than starting a new venture. I asked if there was a reason the United States in particular has been home to so many communal groups. The United States is probably the most attractive place in the world to set up a communal group because there's relatively freedom. You can do this, and as soon as it was possible to incorporate, George Rapp did that for his Harmony Society because then the liabilities go to the company and so forth. So incorporation is one of the major freedoms that we have here that permits communal groups to form and then be sustained over long periods of time. I asked if America did have, in fact, the most communal experiments of any country. Of course, you can do it like the Soviet Union does, and you have collective farms and you force people to do what you wish. And I suspect that they've had more communal groups in that sense, communistic communal groups than any place else in the world. But if you're talking about this definition of voluntary social units that come together around the vision and that live in proximity or are online and share their lives in that sense, then yes, I would say the United States because of the freedoms that are here. And there have been thousands. There have been thousands of these. And we have material on hundreds of them in the Senate Community Studies archives that are here on campus and genital presides over the collection. Not only do you have to get along with the people inside your group, you have to also get along with the larger community next door. Being a bad neighbor to the general public is one of the surest ways to guarantee failure. Nothing exists in isolation. And even though you might want an isolated situation, it can't be. You must deal with the people on the outside and get things from them and maybe sell things to them or try to convince them that your ideas are good. So that boundary of interaction is really very important. And if you don't handle that, it's like moving into a neighborhood and you don't really fit there for whatever reasons. And the people don't accept you in that neighborhood. That's not going to work out very well. I asked for examples of groups failing this test of neighborliness. I'm going to refer, I think that maybe a prime example is Jim Jones and the People's Temple. If you look at their history, their early message, as it was preached by Jim Jones effectively in Indianapolis, was equality among the people. It was trying to get past racism. It was trying to preach love and goodwill 
It was dispensing all sorts of benefits to the people in the area, food and clothing and so forth. And I think that the fact that uh, Jim Jones became so dictatorial and eventually was delayed brought that movement down. Laura Cole and other people associated with the that movement, what became known as the People's Temple, were totally enmeshed in that vision. And as long as he preached that and wasn't doing fake healings and wasn't paddling kids that he would stand up on the windowsills and all that sort of thing, he was into politics. He would he could deliver a crowd. Who was the major figure who went there? One of the trying to think, but at the time he had so many of his people there, and I believe he sat on the platform with whoever this was who was very prominent at the time, political. So the original message that Jim Jones preached was one of humanitarianism, was one of uplift of the community, love. They would hug each other in the services and so forth. And I think the fact that he just became so dictatorial and it was all about him eventually, I think that's really what brought that down. Otherwise, the communal aspect, they had a place in the, was it called the Redwoods? in Northern California, where they were living communally, even while they were operating the People's Temple. And Laura Cole in her book talks about going there. He insisted that she come up there, and so she was part of that. But they introduced communal living, which in itself also was working for a lot of people, but you can't become, as Rap did with the harmonist, you can't become totally dictatorial, people will eventually revolt, even though they will say, Laura Cole would always emphasize, I love these people. I love Jim Jones in the time when he was rational. And so there is energy there that people do respond to, and particularly love. I think for all the hatred there is in the world, sometimes I'm accused of being too naive and too utopian. But I really believe that love prevails in the long run. Love prevails. One of my really interesting students who was a Green Beret and had served in the Vietnam War and paratrooper and so forth, he finally said to me, Don, peace does not come out of the barrel of a gun. And I, I think love is the way people really can associate over long periods of time and in positive ways. The people who come from places like Amana, Iowa, which continues as a community, or New Harmony, the ones where the faith that they established in their communal phase is still going forward. And Amana is a wonderful, the seven Amana colonies is a perfect example descendants from the early members there talk about the, what shall I call it? It's an ambiance that exists. It's almost an atmosphere of camaraderie that continues as a part and as a vital part, a living part of the heritage that came from their communal origins. And they prized that. I've been in services there, and they still sit on different sides of the meeting houses, men on one side, women on the other side. They have a great reverence for the faith. And just recently, one of the ladies from there has finished a translation of the writings of their founder and they stay with the ideas, and those are eternal truths, principles that very definitely work, and ultimately they're based on love for one another and their love for God. 
So these people are very positive about that side of the development of those colonies. They are also continually very capitalistically oriented. And if you go to the Amanda colonies, you will come away with a lot of souvenirs and clothing and other things that you bought from them. So it's not just the religious side, the effective capitalism came through as well. When I asked Jennifer about the most important concerns when it comes to starting your own commune, she echoed Pitzer's emphasis on good governance. If you're going to create the structure where your community can live within, there's got to be a controlling mechanism, particularly in the early years. Now, you could argue you could grow that out, but in the beginning, consensus decision making does not work very well. Eco villages today are finding that out. All right, they started thinking, well, we'll be consensus. Everybody's got one vote. Well, you suddenly find that you can't get anything done. If you've ever been to a city hall meeting or a family meeting, you will have seen this coming. Exactly. Consensus just really doesn't work. So you would need that. You would need a leader who was strong enough to attract people. Also, that leader's already got to have a purpose and probably a plan. Otherwise, what's he using to attract people? And then he's got to be strong. They have to be strong enough to hold the structure in place while the foundations get laid to support whatever comes next. With leadership being such an important aspect of any group's survival, I assumed that developing a secession plan would be at the top of every organization's to-do list. I can't think of a single group that ever designated a next charismatic leader. Now the Shakers, and I'm not a Shaker expert, but Annalise starts the Shaker tradition. And that survives long after she's gone. But I think that's because she sets up a council of elders, a a governance structure that isn't dependent on her. If your structure is dependent on you, I don't think you can pass the torch. So maybe the ideal structure is a charismatic leader working within a tiny republic, a tiny oligarchy, or something like that. I think oligarchy would be better than republic. I'd imagine that the common member of the harmless society had very little input into what they were going to do and how they were going to do it and when it was going to get done. One of the most interesting things that I learned was how much thought goes into the actual layout of these communities. With the communal groups, there's the village model. And the village model is based on rings. So you have your main village in the center, and you could actually have little rings within your community houses. So the inner ring is where everybody lives, and then there's an outer ring, and that's where your gardens, your vegetable gardens are. And then there's a ring beyond that, and that's where your animal husbandry will happen for everybody. And then there's an additional ring outside of that's the natural barrier. So everybody's plants, their gardens are all around this peripheral. They're not in your yard. They're in this zone around the village. And then there's the homestead model. So Dancing Rabbit is the village model. And a bunch of people at Dancing Rabbit said, I don't want to have to walk all the way out here to feed my goats and tend my vegetables. So they bought land adjacent and built red earth. And that's a homesteading model. So in the homesteading model, Red Earth is one community, but you own your own lots. You have your own designated lots and you do whatever you want on your lot. If you want to grow vegetables and have sheep, whatever you want to do on your lot. But it's the village model that makes me think about the harmonists and the shakers. Because, yeah, there is. Now, the reason for that is is because you want your animal waste out on the periphery. You don't want it in with your garden. There's actually a reason why, but that's the structure of the community. So, you, And if you don't want to live in that structure, then you're going to go to another community. Dancing Rabbit was set up that way from day one. They knew they wanted to do the village model. 
I asked if there was any way for a commune to function with truly private property and private wealth. That's a that's an interesting question. So immediately, as soon as you own your own property, you've already created a division, right? Even if it's a land trust where people do own their own lots, but they basically live under a covenant, like a gated community. These are the rules if you want to live here. And if you want to sell your property because you don't want to live here anymore, we have to approve who buys your property. Whereas if it's all communal, and I'm just, let's say, leasing space on top of the land. I don't own it. I think private land ownership can lead to a breakdown in a community. I think that's where I'm headed with that. I guess if I were looking at a community, I think communal land is the way to go because everybody has to buy in. And if you want out, if one person takes their lot in the middle of the community and sells it to an industrial company, the community's lost. I don't know, I can't answer your question directly as to prohibitions I have seen, because in modern communities, they are few and far between. Although many of them do require that you pony, you have to buy in. There is a certain buy. At Dancing Rabbit, you can make your living any way you want. There's a lot of people there who they allocate a lot of their money for internet because they work remotely. Like I talked to this couple, they do commercial editing for studios in California. So she said, when we sat down and became a member of the community, we knew that our priorities were this. So we don't worry so much about spending on this, that, or the other, because this is our priority, which means that if we can't produce enough electricity from our own solar or wind, and we have to buy it from the community, we know that's an allocation. We're willing to give up this over here and pay for that. Whereas another person would say, I don't need internet. I'd rather spend my money this way and never have to buy from the community for that. They are very open. Almost all of them though, even the ones where you buy your land, you can't just sell it to anybody. The community makes you approve it. And I think that is important for a community to survive. Jennifer and I ran through a few scenarios as to how corrupt leaders might use property and religious conviction to control and manipulate members. If I'm building a Jonestown, I'm starting with the people. And in order to control the people, I have to come up with a system that's either going to inhibit them to the point where I can control them absolutely, or I have to come up with a program that they're going to just so buy into it that it doesn't matter what happens, they're on the train to heaven or whatever. And then the land and the space means nothing. It's the control of the people, because I can take the space wherever. Sadly, this sort of thing happened all the time. And we've all heard horror stories, though they would take us beyond the boundaries of this conversation. I'd like to thank Jennifer and Dr. Pitzer again for joining me. And I hope I can sit down with them again in the near future. Thanks for listening.